I count it a real privilege to be able to explain the Bible to you. This is a bit of a strange setting, a strange way of doing it, but we give thanks to God for technology, which means we can do this, even though we have to be separated from, from one another. Thank you to Paul for the opportunity to do this, and I pray that God would use it and will bless you at Bank Hall as I share God's word with you. At Hope Church, we are going through the book of Exodus, so I thought I would share with you this morning some words from Exodus chapter 4, and we're going to read Exodus chapter 4, verse 18, and to the end of the chapter. This is a passage that follows on from God speaking to Moses at the burning bush. Exodus chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 18. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt... See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took her flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time she said bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the desert to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. God is truly worthy of our worship. God is truly remarkable. Everything that we can see in this world in its complexity and diversity is but an echo of his splendor, worth and majesty. Would you consider some of the attributes of God? God told Moses his name. He said, I am who I am. God is the uncreated one, forever existing. One God in three distinct parts, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in perfect harmony, needing nothing, self-sustaining, with all power, with all knowledge. He is truly autonomous, self-determining. Have you ever been disappointed? Have you you ever had a situation where somebody says, try this food, it is absolutely amazing. It will blow your socks off. I had an experience like that and I tried it and the person said to me, so tell me, what did you think? And I was like, yeah, it was good. But after you gave it such a glowing recommendation, it, it didn't quite live up to everything that I was expecting. However much we sing God's praises, whether actually or metaphorically, we can never overstate how great he is. All our descriptions of him actually sell him way short. He is without blemish, without weakness. 
Everything he does is excellent and praiseworthy. And this is the good news of the gospel. This amazing God decided to create people, to love him, to serve and worship him, to be devoted to him, to taste his greatness and his glory. See, his glory is expansive. He created people to join in that, to give him praise and adoration and to be truly satisfied and content in him. Exodus chapter 4, verses 18 to 31, you could say contains five sections. It, it seems a bit bitty. Moses speaks to his father-in-law about going back to Egypt. God gives Moses some instructions. God seeks to put Moses to death. Aaron meets Moses. Moses and, the Aaron, and Aaron meet the elders of Israel. So there's lots of different elements. It's also a tr it's also a transitional passage. So it sees Moses going from the desert with his sheep back to Egypt with his people. Returning and going back are repeated words. So just look down at your Bible and look with me at verse 18. Let me go back. Beginning of verse 18, Moses went back. As we keep going, verse 19, go back. Verse 20, he started back to Egypt. So we see it's all about going back for Moses. It's also a puzzling passage. We have Moses, who God has appeared to, God's rescuer for his people. And then God is seeking to take Moses' life. Or it might be that God is seeking to take Moses' son's life, depending on how you understand the passage. But there, Moses' wife circumcises Moses' son and touches either Moses or Moses' son's feet, although some people think that might be a euphemism, but whoever it is touches their feet and the Lord spares whoever it was he was seeking to take the life of. This is one commentator's opening line about this section. What happened next is a shocking reminder how strange the Old Testament can be. It's also a difficult passage because God says to Moses that he, God, will harden Pharaoh's heart. <clears throat> and so when we pull all this together, our short amount of time means that we can't explain every single detail in great depth. In fact, we can't explain anything in any great depth. But it is my most sincere prayer that we will stick close to what God has said and we will see what God has said rather than relying on our own understanding. At the end of this passage, God's people are provoked, are stirred up to worship God. And my prayer is that our response will be the same, to worship God for who he is and what he does. And in fact, I think it's a useful way to summarise these verses by looking at them to teach us something about worship. And so we're going to have three points about worship. If you would like a New Testament text as a summary for what I think we learn from these verses, it would be Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. This is what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. First point, completely. This is verses 18 to 20. Worship of God is not a one-hour slot on a Sunday plus some midweek stuff if I'm super spiritual. Worship of God impacts your life completely. The decisions you make, the ambitions you have, where you spend your energy, time and money. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it does not say... Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer half a day on Sunday every now and again. Nor does it say, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to put some money in the offering now and again. God does not demand one-tenth of your money. Nor does he demand 168th of your life. That's one hour a week, by the way. <clears throat> Worship is to offer your body 
as a living sacrifice. He wants you completely, entirely. This is why, of course, being a Christian is impossible unless you are born again. Unless God changes your heart so that you delight in him and love him and are satisfied by him. If that's not happened, the demands of worship are just far too great for us to sustain. The spirit of God in the heart of man increasingly, now of course there are some blip days, of course some cold days, but the spirit of God in the heart of man increasingly brings about worship, joy and satisfaction in God. It's not a duty to worship him, it's a way of life. Picture a family unit, a husband who loves his wife. It is no duty to provide for his family. It is a delight for him. And in the same way, those who have been born on, from God, born from high, those people, it's, a, it's not a duty, it's a delight to worship God. Now, what's all that <clears throat> got to do with Exodus chapter 4? Well, in response to God's word to Moses, Moses packs up his family, gets a staff of God, gets his donkey, hopefully the deluxe model with cup holders. It's a long way to Egypt. And do you notice what he does? Even in fact, before he does any of that, it's in verse 18, he goes to Jethro, his father-in-law, and asks him a question. Let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. He asks for Jethro's Permission and the response from Jethro is, go and I wish you well. In a patriarchal society, such as where Moses lived, going and asking permission was the right way to do something. Moses, the man of God, is showing his worship of God in every ordinary day life. Moses took off his sandals when in God's presence, that was worship, and now... He does the right thing in his family life. That is worship because we are always in the presence of God. Please just note, Moses was 80 years of age at this point, And yet he was still humble enough and respectful enough to treat his father-in-law right. That is worship. See, worship impacts my everything. It impacts me completely. It impacts how I speak to my in-laws. It impacts how I leave my home. Teenagers, young adults, 80-year-olds like Moses. How are you treating your parents if they are still alive? If you've left home recently or are about to leave home, love mum and dad in how you do that. That is worship. We don't just live out our Christian worship in the church sanctuary. We live it out in our parents' sitting room. As God gets hold of our hearts, he changes our relationships. He changes us completely, entirely. That's our first point. Worship changes us completely in every sphere of our lives. Second point, covenant. Worship depends on God's covenant. I think that's what we see in verses 21 to 26. In the book of Numbers, Moses is described as the most humble man on earth. Now, I suspect, since Moses wrote the book of Numbers, that an editor added that sentence, because if Moses says, I'm the most humble man on earth, it sort of makes that null and void. It's a bit like the joke, I've written a book on humility, you want to read it, it's absolutely fantastic. You just, it just doesn't work, does it? You've not learnt any of the lessons. And Moses is either on an absolute roll here, or he's showing real humility. So as he's writing Exodus, do you think he's turning to the Israelites and saying to them, okay guys, have you got any stories of mine to put in this book? And they go, yeah, yeah, we've got one. Tell of the time how you were really foolish and had all these excuses why you didn't want to rescue us. Or we've got one. Tell of the time about how God was trying to put you to death. You know, Moses, what's he doing? Is he just throwing this together? No, I think he's showing genuine humility and ordering these things in a God-inspired way to help us to learn a lesson. It's not random. 
in these sections, I, I think they've been put together for a reason. We are told about two men who God is going to judge. In the first section, we're told about Pharaoh coming under God's judgment. And then in the second section, verses 24 to 26, we're told about somebody else coming under God's judgment. To me, it seems like it's Moses that is coming under God's judgment. Some people think it might be Moses' son, but it doesn't really matter. Two people who are facing God's judgment. One will receive God's judgment, the other will be spared. Let's look at each of these in turn. First, Pharaoh. God made a covenant with Adam. He told Adam, if you disobey me, you will die. That's, that's just the way it is. Disobey God, you die. That's the cost. Pharaoh is living in total disobedience to God. Specifically, he has continued to keep the Israelites, who God views as his firstborn son, as his slaves. God's children should not be slaves serving Pharaoh. They should be sons serving God. The ESV translates the word worship as serve. So the opposite of bondage, we need to realise the opposite of bondage is not autonomy to be free to do as we choose, but the opposite of bondage is actually to be in the service of someone who is generous and kind, the Lord. The Lord loves his children. He wants the best for them. He does not want to see them being exploited and abused, but serving him as they were created to do. I mean, how would you feel if one of your children was being exploited and worked ruthlessly? You would do everything to rescue them, wouldn't you? Moses was to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. In fact, he's to tell Pharaoh that God wants him to let his son go. Pharaoh is to see and feel the affection that God has for his people. We're then told, verse 21, that the Lord will, will harden Pharaoh's heart. That phrase is going to come up time after time in the book of Exodus. The phrase, Pharaoh hardened his heart, is going to come up time after time in Exodus as well. Well, which is it? Well, the Bible says both. Pharaoh is choosing to do something, we see in verse 23. He is refusing to let God's people go, so he is fully responsible. And yet somehow God is in ultimate control. God will give Pharaoh over to the sinful desires of his heart. And in doing so, God will put on display his glory by showing his power. God will receive glory through the signs and wonders he's about to perform in Egypt. Now, I think Moses needed to know that. Because as Moses goes to Egypt, life is going to be tough for Moses. Life is going to be tough for the Israelites. Life is going to be really tough for the, for the Egyptians. And Moses needs to know that God is in control. Which is why God reveals his plan to Moses from the divine perspective. So one man, Pharaoh, receiving God's judgment. Now compare that to what happens in this next strange account in verses 24 to 26. God seeks to put, we'll say Moses, Moses to death. We are not told how. But however it's going to happen, Zipporah, that's Moses' wife, circumcises Moses' son, who we assume to be Gershom, touches Moses' feet probably through, and through the shedding of blood keeps the covenant and Moses is spared. Now, what do I mean keeps the covenant? Well, back in Genesis, God gave the sign or the mark of circumcision to his people as a mark of the covenant. Any uncircumcised male, God says, will be cut off because they've not taken God at his word. So God is bringing judgment on Pharaoh. Why? Because he is refusing to let his people go. God isn't then going to wink at Moses' sin, is he? No. God is powerful and he loves his son. And we will see his dealings with Egypt as a result. But God is also just and his justice is perfect. 
he is not going to overlook Moses' disobedience in not circumcising his son. So it's one thing for Moses to be weak in speech. God can deal with that. It's one thing for Moses to be reluctant to go on his own. God can deal with that. But to act in blatant disobedience will not do. And we need to learn we must not confuse weakness and disobedience. If I'm relying on a, a drink, a bit of a drink to get me through a tough week, that's not weakness. If I've got a secret addiction that takes place in the dark that nobody knows about, that's not just weakness. No, those things are disobedience. God sought to put Moses to death because of his disobedience. It was only through a mediator, a rescuer, through the shedding of blood, through someone keeping the covenant and applying it to Moses, did he receive life and rescue. Would you for a moment just think with me on the greatness of God? We have hard hearts, unresponsive to God, going our own way, being disobedient, deserving of death. God can't wink at your sin or my sin, else he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be deserving of your worship. Yet God has a plan to make us his sons and daughters. The new covenant is through Jesus' blood. It isn't Zipporah that comes to our aid through circumcision, but Jesus, the Son of God, as he dies in our place on a Roman cross. To believe that means Jesus' shed blood is applied to us. The justice of God is satisfied and the grace of God reaches out to us. There's this verse, isn't there? Verse 26, after what Zipporah does, so the Lord let him alone. The same can be said of us because of Jesus' rescue, so the Lord let him alone. He has dealt with our sin and given us his righteousness and we're brought into his family, don't you see? We need to see just how much God loves his children. By the end of the Exodus, Pharaoh knew just how much God loved his children. Worship of God flows from a proper understanding of the covenant. God promises forgiveness, righteousness, adoption and eternal life to all those who believe. And those who have been forgiven much they're the ones who love much. We now do not have circumcision, do we? But we do have two ordinances to show these hidden inner realities of our hearts. The Lord's Supper and believers' baptism. These are commands for all people who are followers of Jesus. Expressions of our worship. Worship flows from understanding and believing and benefiting from the covenant, taking God at his word and receiving all his benefits. In Romans 12, verse 1, Paul begins, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That's what our worship flows from, the mercy of God, God's undeserved kindness towards us. Final point, corporate. So we've seen completely, worship is for our entire lives. See, worship flows from the covenant and now corporate, verses 27 to 31. God keeps his word to Moses. He's already been told that Aaron will come and meet him. And Aaron is on his way. It's been 40 years since Aaron has seen Moses. This is obviously God at work. Aaron has been sent by God to meet with Moses. Aaron hears what Moses has to say. He sees the miracle and he believes. Then Aaron and Moses go to Egypt. They speak to the Israelite elders who also hear, see and believe. And then verse 31 at the end. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. In response to the salvation plan of God for their deliverance, they worship. It's not even completed yet. And yet they worship. They hear what God is going to do, how he is going to work, and together as a group of people, they bow down and praise him. In Romans, Paul does not write, offer your body. He writes, offer your bodies. There's quite clearly a corporate element to this. Understanding the covenant, the gospel, changes our lives completely. 
and it makes us part of a corporate body together. At the moment, because of the current restrictions, we are apart, but we're not apart. I'm sure in many ways through this time, our relationships and interactions have grown all the more. They've in fact been strengthened as God's supernatural work in our life continues to manifest itself. I think at this time we see just how important our church family relationships are. Keep pursuing them, even by watching this service at the normal time. I know that probably isn't possible for everybody, but for most, that's a great way of affirming that we are together worshipping God. Brief side point. One of Moses' excuses for not returning to Egypt was, what if the people don't believe me? They did believe him. How many of our worries never even turn into realities? How easy it is to be paralysed from action because we worry about potential things that never even materialise. A doctor would never say to somebody, nothing we can do now, so now just worry about it. Doesn't happen. Jesus, the great doctor, tells us not to be anxious about tomorrow. So, a great passage. Quite bitty, quite puzzling, contains some difficult things, but some really straightforward applications for us all to take away. Worship of God impacts us completely. We are to worship God, whether in the worship service or in the workshop. Worship is in response to the covenant. It's the only way that we can be forgiven through the covenant, by faith. But that faith works through the sacraments, communion, believers' baptism, and in many other ways. And also there is a corporate element to our worship. Although meeting virtually, be committed to the corporate fellowship in socially distanced, appropriate ways. Telephone, messages, face-to-face, -face, following all the re regulations. God truly is an amazing God, worthy of our praise. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, how it teaches us and instructs us. Please so grip our hearts that worship does become our complete way of life, flowing from our understanding of what Jesus did on the cross as part of the body of Christ. Thank you that that's what you do and you bring about in our lives. Please give us grace, that's reality. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.